The story of Cat and Fiddle Arcade is close to my heart. BD Studio used to be there, and I spent a lot of my childhood in the arcade, waiting for my parents to finish work. G'day and welcome to Forgotten Tasmania. I'm John Stevenson. This photo is dated about 1880, which means it's an Anson Brothers photo, because John Watt Beatty didn't start working as a photographer until 1882. The photo was taken from inside the lane, looking out towards Elizabeth Street. The thing that confuses me is the alley is supposed to date back to 1817, but it doesn't appear in any of the early 1800s maps that I was able to find. So I'm going to talk to my friend and historian Colin Dennison and see what he can tell me about it. So in the classic beady photo of, um, of the lane, so this must be looking out towards Elizabeth Street that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that is Viva's shop, I've got it here somewhere. Uh, they were chemists and they were right on the bridge. So is that um, Captain Fiddle Arcade down there? Yeah, that's Captain Fiddle Arcade. Yeah. Yeah. That was Davis Lane. It was called Davis Lane as well. Yeah, it was called. Because I knew it was Elizabeth it had Collins Davis Lane. Lane. It was Collins Lane originally, apparently. Yeah, the, the Collins, Lane. Collins, then it was Elizabeth Lane. Yeah. It? No, it was, it was Davis Lane in before. Davis Lane in before, okay. And then it became Elizabeth Lane, and then Captain Fiddle. They were chemists and they were there for a long time, so there's the Wellington Bridge, and that's Walsh's. My brain likes to play six degrees of separation with itself and I like to find the story underneath the story, or the thing behind the thing, as filmmakers say. The story under the story is the story of the river under the lane. The Hobart Town rivulet was really significant in the placement and success of Hobart Town. In 1804, when Hobart Town was founded, many of the settlers pitched their tents along Collins Street, between Elizabeth and Murray Streets. Governor Collins was very proud of his settlement because it had a permanent supply of fresh running water. I've mentioned the importance of water before, but I don't think I really understood exactly how vital it really was. The rivulet wasn't just a source of water, it was also a source of power. In 1815, Arnold Fisk built the first mill, with a second in 1818 built by the government. In 1819, Fisk built a third mill, between Murray and Elizabeth Streets. The rivulet provided power for timber mills and water for breweries. The course of the rivulet was altered by the mills, land reclamation, dams and flood controls. The first major diversion was the New Cut, began in 1824. It ran parallel to Collins Street to join the Park Street rivulet. The original stream bed east of Collins Street was filled in to form the new market place around 1825. In 1882, the flow of water and detritus was contained in a canal with timber retaining walls, which ran along the line of what's now Evans Street. Then in 1914, the stream was diverted through a major culvert and a tunnel under the Queen's Domain to reach the Derwent River north of Macquarie Point. The canal was then filled in to become Evans Street. Back in 1828, the rivulet was getting polluted by industrial waste, so they built the town tunnel made of brick from the rivulet up to Anglesey Barracks where they had a reservoir. Water was piped from there into the city and this became the first reticulated water system in Hobart Town. From the photo and sketch of the original ship hotel on the corner of Elizabeth and Collins Street, we can see the level of Elizabeth Street has changed significantly since the early 1800s. Elizabeth Street's been filled in, and that's part of the Hobart Town rivulet becoming an underground river instead of an open stream. The original course of the rivulet came out around where Zero Davy is today, and boats could row up the rivulet to the centre of Hobart Town to unload goods and passengers. However, a common stopping place for these rowboats was a pub called the Victoria Inn, although it was referred to as the Dewdrop Inn, and it became the main drinking establishment for men working on the wharves and people living in the infamous Wapping District. In 1860, it was renamed the Young Queen, I presume in honour of Queen Victoria. By 1877, it was called the Terminus Hotel, and it was demolished in 1916. The current Terminus Row is roughly where that pub was, the boats could go as far as Wellington Bridge, which is in the current mall. Wellington Bridge was the address for Anson Brothers Studio, which became Beatty Studio. Collins Lane ran next to the rivulet. A pub called the Cat and Fiddle Inn opened along the lane. Australia's first playwright, Evan Henry Thomas, was an Irish lawyer who arrived in Hobart Town in 1822. In May 1823, he married Sarah, the widow of Richard Wallace, 
licensee of the Cat and Fiddle Hotel and the Albion Hotel. In 1824 he was appointed editor of the Hobart Town Gazette without the permission of Lieutenant Governor George Arthur. Thomas's editorials promoted the idea of a free press and a colony of free settlers instead of convicts. When Governor Arthur claimed that the Hobart Town Gazette was government property, Thomas was sent to Sydney to appear before Governor Brisbane, who agreed with him over Arthur. Thomas wrote an editorial on the 8th of October 1824, openly criticising Arthur's government. The Attorney General Joseph Jellybrand declared this article libelous. When the trial took place in July of 1825, Thomas had already resigned as editor of the Gazette, but the owner, Mr Bent, was found guilty by the military jury. The Albion Hotel, which belonged to Thomas's wife before their marriage, was sold in May of 1827, and Thomas moved his family to Launceston. Thomas produced his three-act play, The Bandit of the Rhine, in the Launceston Theatre. This was the first original play to be wholly written and published in Australia. The play was staged in the Theatre Royal Hobart on the 22nd of October 1836. Thomas died a year later, aged 36, and was buried in the old Cypress Street Cemetery, Launceston. The Cat and Fiddle Inn was, by all accounts, quite a rowdy and disreputable place, frequented by all and sundry, including whalers, gentlemen and prostitutes. The lane became known as Cat and Fiddle Alley, but was later renamed Elizabeth Lane. When the shopping arcade opened in the 1960s, it was called Cat and Fiddle Arcade, although the official name remains Elizabeth Lane. I've seen different figures for the number of people living along the lane. Some say 20, some say 200, but either way it seems the lane was also a residential area. So down this laneway, you were telling me, so I mean, yeah, there, was a, there was a pub there, but yeah. you were saying there were also a lot of people lived on the right. lane. You said people were living yeah. on the lane as well? Yeah, so there were houses people there. living in the lane. There was wow. quite a few, there was about 60 odd supposed to have been living there. The Albion Hotel was added as a satellite to the Cat and Fiddle Inn. It was a higher class establishment fronting onto Elizabeth Street, although it had a walkway out the back so guests could get their pleasure at the Cat and Fiddle Inn but still be seen entering and leaving via the Albion, maintaining the illusion of respectability. The Albion Hotel was the terminus for Cooley's coaches, 1825 to 1835, and the hotel survived until the 1960s when it was demolished to make way for a bank. In 1862, Cat and Fiddle Alley was the address for Charles Davis American Hardware. Metal building materials would have been in demand in the 1800s, so recycling was important, but it was called scrap metal back then. In the photo we can see an ironworks, and that looks like scrap metal on the cart to me. Charles Davis had established the business in 1847. George Parker Fitzgerald founded GP Fitzgerald, a Tasmania-wide department store in the mid-1880s. The company existed as GP Fitzgerald & Co Limited until 1918, but it was taken over in 1911 and became part of Charles Davis Limited. It stayed in control of the Davis family until it was taken over in 1971 by Sir Donald Triscothic. At its peak, the company was Australia's fourth largest retailer. The company was renamed Harris Scarf Holdings Limited in 1995. The modern Cat and Fiddle Arcade opened in 1962. Parents brought their kids to watch the animatronic Cat and Fiddle nursery rhyme clock and the cow jumping over the moon. But we secretly all just wanted to play with the fountain, holding the water squirts and making them go up and down. Maybe that was reminiscent of the rivulet long since buried underground. Flooding was always a problem, with major floods in 1929, 1947, 1960 and more recently in 2016 when the construction of the new Meyer building caused the rivulet to break its banks and spill out into the arcade once again. There was a lawsuit over that one. Having survived the Great Fire of 1933, Beatty Studio had its home in Murray Street for many years. While the arcade was built, they had to move out, but they were early tenants at Shop 33 on the upper level when the arcade opened. The shop was downstairs, just a small reception really, where customers could book in for their photos and then proceed upstairs to the studio on the top floor. My dad told me he often had six or more weddings attend the studio on a Saturday. In 1993, unable to sell the business as a going concern, he made the tough decision to close the doors and run the business only as a museum. Firstly from his house and then later from my brother's place. Today the museum is online at www.beattystudio.com 
I got so carried away with my guerrilla filmmaking and the nostalgia of the arcade that I nearly forgot to recreate the photo. The arcade survived the departure of Beaties, but I don't see any photographers in there now. Perhaps photography as a business is about to go that way too. I don't like to finish the episode on a downer, but in these uncertain times, who can say? I'm going to keep making videos, and I hope you continue to enjoy them. We are Tasmanian. These are our stories. This is Forgotten Tasmania.